Let's say good morning to our first guest, Senator Charles Trump. He is the judiciary chair in the state Senate. Charlie, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Senator. I was waiting for Bill to chime in. <laughs> okay, good morning, Senator. <laughs> good morning, John. No, no, no. Now, we've, now we've got that behind us. Okay. <laughs> That's good. You know, Bill just admires you so much, Charlie, that when I have you on the show, like I can normally tell when Bill wants to ask a question because he'll put his index finger up. <laughs> And that means nobody else in the room talks. I have a question. <laughs> so I always watch for that index finger wagon. And when that's wagon, I know the admiral wants the ship. But today, when or whenever you're on, he his seat's rocking back and forth on its wheels. He's leaning into that microphone. I can hear him taking big big inhale breaths so he can get out his sentence. And I couldn't hold him back today, Charlie. See. Well, uh, that's good to hear. Uh, I'm a big admirer of Bill. And I uh, have been for a long time. You should be in the studio today, uh, Charlie, and see, see how much of what Rob's saying is actual truthful or what's the other word? More truthful. <laughs> more truthful. Truthy. <laughs> truthlier. More truthlier. Uh, Charlie, let's talk about the park up your way. That's been a topic of conversation in regards to uh, 350 RVs and, and, and such. And, uh, you know, Craig Blair, the Senate president, about two weeks ago was the first one to state that. Uh, a lot of this permitting might not actually go through. And then fr I think it was Friday, a decision was finally made. Can you bring us up to speed? Yeah, I got a call on Friday, uh, Rob, from the, the State Department of Commerce. that, uh, And basically I talked to the Secretary of Commerce, and he indicated that they didn't think they were going to proceed forward on any of the three proposals that had been submitted uh, to the state in response to an RFP that the state put out, I guess it was at the end of last year. Did they, and, and did they say why they made that decision? Uh, yeah, although I think there are probably multiple reasons. I don't, I'd probably be oversimplifying it. I think they viewed two of them, two of the three proposals they got, as not really fitting uh, with the RFP or complying with the RFP mm -hmm. that they uh, issued. Um, w which was for a proposal for an RV park or RV facilities inside the park um, uh, to be paid for by uh, whoever was going to do the proposal. So they had have, they have one proposal that was for an RV park that was outside of Cucapin State Park. They had one proposal for uh, from an entity that said, you know, we would manage an RV, RV facilities inside the park, but you all would have to, the state would have to build them. And then the third proposal they got was from a company called uh, Blue Water. I think it was called Blue Water. Mm -hmm. And they had a couple different variations, one of which, as you just mentioned, included a proposal for uh, an RV camping area that would include 350 uh, slips or units. Yeah. And uh, they, you know, the conversations I've had with uh, commerce and parks uh, are similar to the conversations that I've had with constituents here. Everybody thinks that's just too big. It's yeah. not, it'd be inconsistent with what we have there at Cape and State Park. Uh, Charlie, a question that came up the other day when this has been discussed, once the RFP has been let, uh, there has to be, a, to reject a, a bid, it has to be for legitimate cause. Otherwise, there's a penalty to be paid. Uh, in this case, uh, just because the state changed their mind, is that legitimate reason not to go ahead and let the RFP? I'm glad they're doing that, but I'm just thinking from the legal aspect. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Bill, I, I read that RFP in some detail when it was put out. And I think they did a really uh, uh, careful job of making it clear from the very beginning that the state was reserving the right to reject any and all proposals. So I don't, I don't think there are any legal issues uh, that any of the people that submitted proposals could raise against the state because it was clear from the beginning that they, the state was – they were not committing to proceed on, you know, one or a, a winning proposal. They, they really it was more in the nature of 
hey, we'd like to see what what people are thinking and what's out there. So uh, I interpret from that that the uh, the RFP uh, was written in such a way the state could change its mind if it chose to do so. The, yes. Okay. And that's their that's their position. That's the Department of Commerce's position and the DNR's position that they were never uh, committed to taking any of the proposals they got. What do you envision the next step to be? Well, uh, the DNR has told us the answer to that a little bit. And part of what they released on Friday, uh, they've decided to, uh, I think, conduct surveys, not just for uh, Morgan County and the Eastern Panhandle, but I think, uh, I think more broadly statewide to find out from the citizens of the state what sort of amenities they would like to see added or not added to their various state parks. Now, uh, the amenities to be added, would this be done under public-private partnership, or is the, are the state parks sitting on a sizable amount of money, and they may, I just have not been following that close, that they could affect these, these amenity changes? Uh, it could go either way. Uh, the, the, law gives them, the law gives the state some authority to enter into agreements with, with uh, private contractors under which it would be a joint arrangement for it's limited in the law to new facilities that are constructed in other words the law doesn't permit a private contractor to say you know okay we'll build you x but then we want to run your your lodge and your cabins and your golf course which are already there Uh, but the, the law does allow the state to enter into an agreement with a developer uh, to have a developer pay for the construction of new facilities in a park and then uh, have some arrangement with the state on how it would be managed. Uh, that's, that's one option. Another option is for the state to use state dollars. As you know, the, the state in the last five years has made a pretty enormous investment in uh, Capon State Park with the addition to the lodge and refurbishing of cabins uh, in order of tens of millions of dollars. Uh, And that was done with uh, state dollars, uh, basically uh, bonds that are where the debt service is paid for through the West Virginia lottery. Uh, So to answer your specific question, DNR is, I don't think DNR views itself as sitting on a big, enormous pile of money that it can uh, plug into uh, Kikapin or other parks beyond that which it's already expended. Uh, but as you know, the state is in pretty good fiscal shape. Uh, you know, we have surpluses even with the tax cuts that we enacted this year. We're we're going to be running surpluses, and those things which you know five or six years ago you know would have been considered impossible or unlikely. Uh, given the state's fiscal situation at the time, uh, are possible now. Yeah, and a lot of tribute goes to uh, 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 to you folks and ensuring that we do have the financial cushion to do things. You're exactly right. Several years or so ago, I remember when Capen uh, was first uh, being proposed for for renovation uh there was a uh, uh the the county officials in morgan county uh did a lot of uh approaching other counties saying would you give up some of your requests so that we could do the what we need to do in Kikapin? and the, the eastern panhandle region was very happy to to work with morgan county on that and now you're saying we're really past that stage we can actually do some stuff uh, without kind of uh getting mutual agreement through all the eastern panhandle to work on something Uh, that's right the state's overall fiscal situation is much better than it was five or six years ago goodness in 2015-16 we didn't have two nickels to rub together we had a very hard time making a balanced budget which our state constitution requires we have you know we can't borrow money and deficit spend except in limited circumstances and uh, that that situation has changed pretty dramatically 
over the last six or seven years. John? Speaking of money, the uh, if you heard the open, and maybe you already knew otherwise, uh, Sheriff Harmon in Berkeley County kicked quite a hornet's nest last week when he talked about security issues at our schools. And on on this show, the superintendent of schools, uh, Ron Stevens, I think is his name, mm-hmm. um, we, we're talking about security things, and it ultimately comes down to they are doing everything they can with the resources they have, resources being money for the most part. So extrapolating out to your knowledge, this I'm assuming this is not just a Berkeley County issue, that it it goes to other counties as well. So with all of this extra revenue and extra money that we have hanging around, is there a line item that you're aware of within the state budget to address school security issues, or is it, if not, should it be? Yeah, it's a great question, John, and thank you for asking it. Uh, there are some lines in the budget that are dedicated in the in the ed budget toward uh, school security, but it's not enough. And uh, I think all of us agree that we have a bunch more to do. Uh, and it's a problem. It's a problem that exists across the entire state. But I will say this, in Berkeley County, it's probably more acute than it is anywhere else just for the simple reason that Berkeley County is in the constant process and rotation of having to expand and add educational facilities. Uh, You know, the student growth in Berkeley County is not matched by any other county in the state of West Virginia. And so that creates lots of of, uh, special, special problems and concerns. But we haven't had, in Morgan County, we haven't had the kind of student growth that Berkeley County has. But I just became aware this past week of a situation we have in Morgan County a school resource officer who's been here for a long time. It's essentially a police officer, a sheriff's deputy in the school who's going to retire. And so the the Board of Ed has been looking to uh, secure a person to replace him. And uh, there are some training requirements uh, they, they've got a good candidate who comes from another state, and there's a training requirement, a two-week training requirement uh, for this retired law enforcement officer to update his uh, skills, but the course isn't going to be offered till next March. And so, you know, we, we, I'm, I'm on that one right now. I'm going to ask the governor to consider adding whatever, uh, whatever legislation – we have to pass to fix that problem uh, to a call for a special session as soon as the governor calls us back in for anything. And, yeah. You know, as you know, we we have generally we'll have special sessions uh, a couple of times every year. And this is on the list of things we got to fix. You know, we have a process. We have school resource officer. The board has a candidate, somebody they've identified as probably pretty good. But, you know, we're in this weird situation where uh, he needs a two-week refresher training course that isn't offered in this calendar year. Is a school so, resource officer a, a, a specific job in and of itself, or is it someone who's borrowed from the sheriff's department? There may be there may be more than one way to do that in different counties. The way it has worked in Morgan, which is what I'm most familiar with, is it's been a deputy. Uh, it's been a deputy sheriff, a member of the sheriff's department, whose I think whose salary and expense expenses for his service are borne by both the sheriff's department and the educational, the board of ed, in some combination. Bill, yeah, uh, picking up, I think what John was saying a couple minutes ago. We heard last week, uh, Senator, that the the money that was allocated last year, year before last, uh, to address uh, school security, in large part, was targeted or identified as cameras, which cameras are needed, but cameras are certainly not the only thing that's required. Uh, let me pick up on a, a discussion that we had last week. Uh, uh, there was some 
uh, both the sheriff and the school board and school system were on board saying different things. Uh, County Commissioner Gokenhauer, Eddie Gokenhauer, uh, was listening to the show. He has called a meeting, I think, for tomorrow with all the principal parties trying to open these doors of communication so that we would not have the, the confusion that appeared to appear that, that we apparently had last week. So. Well, that's good. I, you know, communication is always good. Bill, you know, I think I've talked about this. My, you know, I have, I believe I have this philosophy. I think 90% of the problems in the world are fundamentally communication problems. And that includes problems between husbands and wives and problems <laughs> between nations. Uh, and you can solve a lot of problems and avert a lot of problems with good communication. And so my compliments to Eddie for recognizing that and doing it. Uh, well, it's the nature of this sort of thing. When we're talking about school security or any security. You know, the truism is that the good guys have to be right 100% of the time and the bad guys only have to be right once. And I th- when it comes to the across the board, outside of Berkeley County and Morgan County and you know, throughout the state, the hardening of schools and the hiring of, of uh, resource officers and such sort of represent the, the bare minimum. Certainly the hardening of hardening schools represent the bare minimum. School resource officers are kind of an extra step. Um, I guess my question to you is in the coming sessions, it seems to me that this is a worthwhile discussion for, for very specific expenditures. One of the things that Superintendent Stevens brought up was that uh, there was a plug of money, and I'm sorry, I won't get the specifics right, but th- there was a plug of money that had to be spent equally among all of the schools in Berkeley County, which came down to like, I don't know, $240 or something per school by the, by the time it's all put out. So sometimes the numbers, it seemed like big numbers, by the time they filter out, aren't all that big. So as we sit on these surpluses and as we sit on all this additional revenue, what do we do to apportion these extra funds towards some of these these great causes? Well, uh, there, there are a couple things we could do. Uh, in my view, uh, the legislature probably, rather than trying to fashion or design you know, its own one-size-fits-all program, uh, I think, would do, do well to uh, let local boards of education uh, have a little more flexibility in terms of designing what will enhance security in, from county to county, school district to school district. Uh, and, you know, I generally favor uh, a less centralized and more localized approach to solving uh, all kinds of problems like that, uh, with with some investment by the state and research into the questions of what really works. What are the most effective ways to harden a school to protect kids and and staff who are out of school? Uh, you know, those are valid questions, and we have sadly we have enough uh, experience now in this country uh, on that question we, that we should be able to uh, examine some data and draw some conclusions about which measures work better, which ones don't work as well. Senator Charles Trump is our guest here on the program. He is the West Virginia Senate Judiciary Chair. Go ahead, John. I was just going to say, and then we have to recognize that that securing an 80-year-old building is entirely different than securing a building that we're, that's brand new. That's true. You know, I I don't know what the ratio is in in terms of these incidents per number of schools around the country. I don't know if it's one out of every one million schools, one out of every hundred thousand, one out of every one thousand. I don't know what the numbers are. I just know that if that school is holding people that you care about, it's a bad ratio for you if it's if it's an incident. And Senator Trump, you know, the the only way to do this is, is the right way. And, and that includes making sure we have secure safety doors with the appropriate glass in there that can be at least resistant to some extent to gunfire. Uh, ground floor windows all the way around the building, ground floor doors all the way around the building have to be secured, and it's got to be the appropriate glass on those windows if, if we're going to prevent some nutcase from just going around to the side of the school. 
Uh, you could put a resource officer in every school, but all this costs money. It costs a lot of money, Charlie. And ultimately, it's it's up to a society to determine how it wants its tax dollars spent and how thorough it wants its security to be for these soft target areas. Well, that's right. It's like every every public expenditure of money. Uh, ideally, you have a, in a free a free and democratic small d society uh government uh the 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 lawmakers listen to uh the the citizens who are sovereign and prioritize based on prioritize expenditures based upon what the citizens want and uh you know i for me and and i think i think for most people this is a this is a priority issue at least that's what i'm hearing from everybody i talk to you know, Charlie, let's get ahead of this. Let's do something in West Virginia that works to make sure we're, we don't become one of these uh, horrible headlines that we've seen so frequently across the country. Senator, let me push back a little bit on that, if I can. Uh, during the last session, uh, we heard a tremendous amount about uh, uh tax reform, uh, revising our tax structure. And that's where a lot of the bucks, a lot of the time and effort went. We heard a lot about the DHHR. We heard some about the corrections. I don't remember any discussion, at least filtered down to us, talking about the security of our schools. And that, and John uh, pointed out a second ago, it's going to require a lot of money. Uh, we have, uh, instead of, we could have diverted that money toward the hardening the schools, or we could choose to for a tax cut. And in this instance, we chose the tax cut. So I guess I come back to the fact where in the priority system did our uh, school security actually lie? Well, it, you know, it's a fair point. Uh, the uh, tax cut, tax cuts that we enacted have been a long-standing priority of the legislature to try to make uh, West Virginia more competitive, and we were able to lower per state personal income tax rates to be equal to or under the rates of our surrounding states, which we think. Uh, will help in the long term for growth of the state and uh, growth of the economy, growth of the population. Uh, we, we there, but Bill, we did have bills. There were bills on the subject of school security. In fact, some that considered in committees of the Senate. I'm not as sure about the House delegates, uh, but there was uh, a bill that went through uh, that was considered in the Senate to authorize school boards to train up teachers and uh, pay them extra to arm them, uh, to have them be at least in part fulfilling the role of safety guardians uh, in our public schools. Now, I don't think that bill crossed the finish line, uh, but it's not as if there was radio silence on that. There was a good bit of work and discussion and consideration of bills to address that issue. Yeah, and I'm and and I was not implying that uh, there was nothing happening uh, on the session towards school security. My point was they were hearing very little of it, at least on on my level, because most of the attention were directed toward these other other issues. And, and well, and it's a fair point, and part of it, I think, Bill, is because there is not there's not a firm public consensus. Uh, yet on what exactly are, is the right thing to do uh, what are the what are the right measures is it to uh, arm teachers and and school cooks and janitors so that they are uh, trained and armed and prepared to respond in an active shooter situation or is it something else or is it a combination of things Fair point. Uh, how do we come to this consensus? Uh, do we just evolve to it over time and gradually come to a broad consensus? Or is there a more of a proactive approach? Some group take a take uh, the real leadership in pulling all the parties together and develop some consensus that way, which would be a more more rapid approach. Yeah, well, I think the the. Uh the process the, that we're engaged in right now, uh, 
uh, is a part of it. It's communication, public discussion. I will say this. Almost every time I'm on the radio with you guys on your excellent show, uh, which is a you know a forum devoted to the public discussion of issues that are important to people, almost every time after we end the segment, I'll, I'll get a call or two or emails and uh, from people who say, hey, I was listening in, I heard this, I heard that, I think you ought to consider this or that. I think what we're doing right now is an important part of the process. I agree with that, Charlie, completely. Hey, before I let you go, uh, Governor Justice is expected on Thursday from the Greenbrier to announce his candidacy for the U.S. Senate. Any thoughts on that? Uh, Well, it's been long rumored that he was interested in running for the United States Senate, and uh, I think the governor will be formidable. Well, it definitely keeps that guy who travels with him carrying that chair in business for a few more years. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll withhold any comment on that. Uh, the um, So I didn't know that uh, the, there was a date set for a, an official announcement. But I guess what I would say is it's not a surprise at this point because it's been rumored uh, in Charleston and beyond for some time that the governor is interested in running for the United States Senate. Charlie, thanks so much for your time this morning. Always a good conversation. Gentlemen, great to talk to you all. Thank Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Take care. Judiciary Chairman Senator Charles Trump.